So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Kinnebra. I'm an editor at Descent Magazine, and uh, we're thrilled to be welcoming everyone here for this event. Um, for those of you who don't know, Descent is a socialist magazine. We've been coming out since 1954, uh, and for all of those 60 years, um, I would say in one way or another, we've been avid proponents of uh, non-reformist reforms. Um, so I hope we'll be hearing a lot more about uh, two of those tonight. Um, and we'd like to start off by, well, uh, by thanking our wonderful hosts, Verso Books, for this space, and also our co-hosts, um, the New Economy Coalition, who you'll be hearing more about in a second, and Jacobin Magazine for co-sponsoring this, this event. <laughs> Um, so thanks so much again to everyone for coming. And here's Kate, who will tell you a little bit more about the New Economy Coalition. Um, so the New Economy Coalition is a co-host of this event. Um, and I'll spare a sort of boring institutional history, um, but we'll say that we are a member-based organization and our members are organizations. Um, we have 122 members doing everything from environmental work, uh, folks like 350 on the other side of this wall, um, to uh, cooperative development institutes to um, think tanks like the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, and really the reason, part of the reason we exist is to sort of tie together this work that can be so disparate. Um, that's also part of the intention behind New Economy Week, which is part of what this event is kicking off. Um, and the idea is to have a conversation both about um, how to get clear about what we don't want, but also how to get clear about what we do. Um, and so that's part of the intention uh, behind this event, um, is to really start thinking about what does a new economy look like, as, as fraught and sort of complicated as that term can be, um, and what are the policies that are gonna make it happen. Um, so that's why I'm so excited to have uh, these folks here, and we'll hand it off to Jesse to introduce us. Hi everybody. Uh, how's everyone doing tonight? Good. Uh, I'll take that as just okay. Um, <laughs> we're, I'm gonna, my name is Jesse Meyerson. I'm a writer and uh, an activist uh, from New York City. Maybe you've heard of us. And, uh, and I'm so pleased to be introducing these three wonderful folks who um, in part, well, I'm, I'll, I'll spare you that. Anyway, uh, I'll just let you know who they are and then I'll, I'll try and frame the discussion and then we'll hand it off to them. Uh, to my immediate right is uh, Alyssa Battistoni. She is a PhD candidate at Yale and an editor at uh, Jacobin Magazine. Uh, to her right, I'm really trying to like pull this email up where I have all this written down so I don't have to improvise it, but that was all you wanted said about you, right? Okay. Uh, to her right is Pavlina Chernova. She is a, a, an associate professor and I believe the chair of the economics department at Bard College, my alma mater. Uh, she is also a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute, housed at that august institution. Uh, she specializes in the field of modern monetary theory, fiscal policy, macroeconomic stabilization, and the economics of gender. And then finally to her right, Derek Hamilton is the director of the doctoral program in public and urban policy at the New School. Uh, jointly appointed as an uh, Associate Professor of Economics and Urban Policy at the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy at the Department of Economics at the New School for Social Research in, at the New School in New York. Um, and that's our group. Can we have a little warm uh, golf applause for you? Um, just to, so that we're super clear, the, the, uh, the we're talking about a job guarantee and a basic income, and uh, the, the sides roughly break down the following way. Uh, Alyssa tends to write about a basic income, and Pavlina and Derek tend to write about a job guarantee. So that, that's um, what people focus on. So I wanna um, just frame this conversation by quoting from a verso title, which I would um, recommend very highly to everyone, called The Origin of Capitalism by a, a wonderful scholar and writer named Ellen Mikesons Wood. Um, where she details, she, she's, she sets out to refute the idea that um, when capitalism started, that opened up market opportunities for people to take advantage of. We've heard that it liberated the bourgeoisie to take advantage of market opportunities. By pointing out, she says that markets existed for thousands and thousands of years before capitalism emerged. So she says that the change wasn't that it opened up market opportunities, but it, that it subjected all of society to market imperatives. Um, Specifically by taking the peasant, the masses, away from the direct access that they had to the means of their own subsistence and the figure of the 
agriculture that they themselves produce, and forced them propertyless to sell their uh, capacity to work, their labor power for a wage in order to survive. And so she says that this, this tendency, this dispossession, uh, forced the following market imperatives on all of society. Competition, accumulation, and profit maximization, and hence a constant systemic need to develop the productive forces. Uh, these imperatives, in turn, fuel the capitalist laws of motion, she says. Capitalism can and must constantly accumulate, constantly search out new markets, constantly impose its imperatives on new territories and new spheres of life, and on all human beings, and on the natural environment. So if those are the capitalist laws of motion and the socialist project is to uh, arrest that uh, indefinite expansion, uh, then what it has to do is break those imperatives. And uh, it seems clear to me that the way to break those imperatives is to uh, undo that initial dispossession of everybody from the means of their own subsistence by guaranteeing everyone have access to the means of their own subsistence as a matter of guaranteed economic rights without having to subordinate themselves to the dictates of the market, um, the job market. So I see these two ideas, a universal basic income and a job guarantee, which you'll hear um, explanations of in just a moment, as um, candidate ideas for policies that can uh, hope to achieve something like this, an exit from the private <laughs> job market, a liberation of the masses from the dictates of the market. Um, I personally happen to believe that neither of the policies is, as, is up to the, that task as well as they would be together. I, I think, as I say, that task is sort of like the the prime directive for socialists. Um, but uh, so I, we kind of want to tease out a little bit tonight the disagreements between them. They're held up in this format as contending ideas, but hopefully come to a, a place, hopefully from my perspective, come to a place where we can see that they, they could be complementary ideas. So uh, with that said, um, we, the Derek and Alyssa played uh, Rochambeau for it. <laughs> Alyssa lost, so she will be uh, giving the first presentation. Well, each, each person will talk for about five to seven minutes, then I'll ask a bunch of questions, and then we'll turn it over to you guys for questions, yeah? All right. Without further ado, Alyssa Battistoni. Um, thank you, Jesse, for that introduction, um, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm, uh, as Jesse mentioned, going to be making the case um, for basic income, and particularly as a, a key part of a, um, like a feminist, environmentally sustainable, and just future, which I hope uh, will be redundant um, one day, today. Um, but uh, I also do think, you know, I want to emphasize what Jesse is saying about these not being necessarily, I guess, like, um, ideas that are necessarily in opposition. Um, I see a lot of, I think, potential for complementary um, uh, ways of thinking about and using these ideas, and I think that a lot of the sort of like questions that come up around them, um, hopefully, I think as we get into the discussion, will I think show how much we are talking about shared goals and, and similar things, and some of it sometimes feels like very definitional to me. But um, anyway, I'll make the case for my sort of UBI case um, the, with four main points. Um, and so uh, the first thing um, that I want to talk about is how I think um, basic income gives. Uh, workers more power and leverage in general. This is one of, I think, its key attractions, um, and this is true for both of, um, I think, for both of these, but um, I think uh, we see basic income has, um, this, is a, this is a way we can connect uh, environmental justice to the labor movement. Um, I think this, uh, it gives workers more power to say no to industries that are damaging the environment, their health, um, health of communities, um, which uh, tend to be colors of community and working class communities. Um, people tend to know that the uh, industries um, that uh, are causing harmful effects are doing that, but don't feel they have any choice. And I think that a basic income is one way to start offering alternatives. Um, the second uh, goes again to the sort of um, uh, to the link between production and consumption, which I think Jesse's comments um, also framed. Um, and so I think you see in discussions of environmentalism a lot of discussion about overconsumption, the need to cut back, and so on. And um, I think that can easily tip into the language of austerity, particularly when it's not connected to the flip side of thinking about production um, and the sort of vicious cycle of production and consumption um, that is currently required, where you need to sort of you know, you need to produce to be able to consume, but they need to be able to consume enough to keep the economy going so that there are enough jobs for everyone. Um, and I think that while I, it's understandable that that hasn't been the focus of a lot of um, environmental rhetoric, it's been, um, you know, a lot of uh, sort of 
um, past campaigns that did um, sort of set up this jobs versus environment dichotomy and um, the, you know, obviously the green jobs discourse as a way to try to avoid that. Um, but I think that there is an argument to be made for trying to reclaim a sort of job killing environmentalism that's not against work or workers per se, but against just creating jobs for their own sake. Um, and so I think um, on this note, there's like a lot of things obviously that need to be done. Um, the sort of green jobs uh, initiative um, or the, the idea between green, behind uh, green jobs as being sort of a, um, a way to provide work for people as we are trying to do the things we need to do to transition to a, to a sustainable society, um, which tend to be things like infrastructural um, and uh, industrial type of stuff, you know, um, building light rail or, um, you know, uh, solar panels or whatever. Um, I think there are, there are clearly many things that need to happen um, in this particular realm and in many other like kinds of of work, um, and I think this is one place that we can see the connections between basically income and job guarantee. Um, but I also think that um, uh, part of the uh, what we should be thinking about is not just sort of I guess this particular kind of green job that um, you know again is is a sort of um, tends to be in a I guess more like blue collar jobs for a green society, but it, that is thinking about um, different kinds of work that are. Um, about that are less resource intensive forms of social reproduction. Um, and so we might call it like pink color jobs for green, a green society or something like that. But um, things like, um, uh, you know, I think both nursing and care work and teaching and things like this, um, but also like the broader work of, of uh, I think social reproduction, which some of these things are obviously already jobs. Um, we can create jobs doing them. But I think um, that the line between what is, um, you know, what is uh, a job and what is not can be very blurry. And I think that one way to, to recognize the work that, um, or the many kinds of work that go into social reproduction um, without simply making every social interaction a job or a set of tasks, um, and that kind of provides the space to, um, to orient us towards different kinds of, um, uh, I guess different kinds of work is, um, Basic income is one way to, to start doing that. Um, and um, at the same time, it's, I think it's not enough just to sort of transition to um, different kinds of work. We also should just be working less. Um, and uh, I think both in terms of individual well-being, people, when they actually have a choice to, um, to work less rather than having the sort of leisure forced upon them in the form of un or underemployment, um, people tend to like working less when they can. Um, and uh, a number of studies have shown this is also uh, a way to you know, reduce energy um, use and things like this. Um, so I think there's a, a way that we can see uh, working less as not only good for us, but good um, environmentally. Um, and uh, on this note, I think, um, I'm guessing I'm going to transition to like the next two pieces, which are more um, political in nature. Um, one is that I think uh, a basic income suggests uh, new visions of the good life and um, of what we can aspire to. Um, and I think that that's um, a life that can be sustainable but not austere, where we are working less but also have more time to do the things that make life worthwhile. Um, one of the really famous papers about basic income is called Why Surfers Should Be Fed. Um, and it's saying, you know, surfers may not be productive um, in the sense of, uh, so I guess, a tr sort of traditional sense um, of, you know, uh, they're, they're not like contributing to society in some obvious way. Um, but I think that, uh, I guess what I'm arguing is that maybe not just that we should feed surfers, but that maybe more of us should be surfers. Um, I think that uh, recognizing the, the way that um, uh, things like uh, low carbon leisure, um, as one of our attendees has uh, put it, um, can be uh, a way to live um, a life that is, again, a, a sort of rich and full life, but that um, is not necessarily as, as focused on sort of material consumption um, is, uh, yeah, one of the ways that we might start to think about using basic income. Um, and finally, I guess on a, a more politically pragmatic note, um, I think that basic income offers some exciting political possibilities. Um, not uh, 
not just because it appeals to people of different ideological persuasions, as has often been said. Um, uh, you know, there's the sort of uh, point that you know, libertarians also like basic income and things like this, which I think is actually a danger zone. Um, and Jesse has written about this in a way that I think is really good. Um, but because I think it can pull together um, a wider swath of the left um, that brings together, you know, a, a coalition of, of employed people, unemployed people, underemployed people um, can uh, assert that people who have been marginalized and criminalized for being under underemployed are in fact um, you know, can be at the forefront of this kind of organizing. Um, and I think also um, uh, has a lot of traction internationally, interestingly. I think this is a place where we see, um, you know, basic income has been getting a lot of attention um, uh, internationally and also not just in industrialized democracies. Um, while some of the high profile uh, programs are in, um, you know, wealthy European countries, um, there's a, there have been pilots um, in, I think Switzerland is voting on one, there have been um, various proposals, but um, there have also been, there's a lot of growing momentum and, and trial programs in Namibia and places in Southern Africa and places where there is very high, um, very high unemployment rates and not much hope for, uh, I guess, growth, uh, just creating enough jobs for everyone. So I think that this is a place that we can start to look at. Um, emphasizing the universal alongside the basic income, and so um, bringing uh, a sense of, I guess, universal provision um, and, and thinking about international solidarity in new ways. Um, and so um, I guess those are the four main points I want to make for now, um, I guess. But before I close, I want to, I guess, just close my opening remarks with words from two of, I guess, two of my favorite quotes on basic income, which are, or not basic income, but I guess the idea of it. Um, so uh, there's sort of, it's famously been supported by a lot of people um, from Nixon to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but my favorite writer on um, this sort of idea is Virginia Woolf, um, who in A Room of One's Own um, reflects on the instinct for possession, the rage for acquisition, which keeps the stockbroker and the great barrister going indoors to make money and more money and more money, when it is a fact that 500 pounds a year will keep one alive in the sunshine. Um, and I think that this sort of task staying alive in the sunshine is the one before us. Um, and I think figuring out how to get that, you know, 500 pounds a year or whatever it may be for us now um, is, is what both, like all of us here are trying to figure out. Um, and I guess the, my final closing words come courtesy of Beyonce, um, all the people on the planet working nine to five just to stay alive, how come? So. <laughs> Should, should point out before we move to Professor Hamilton that um, Alyssa's essay entitled Alive in the Sunshine in Jacobin Magazine is there for free on the internet. So check that out if you guys have the internet. All right, so today I'm going to talk a lot about the framing of inequality and then federal job guarantee is going to be a, a mechanism to deal with this framing, this uh, inequality. A lot of my conversation is going to be focused on black-white differences. Um, so black-white differences become most evident to address the discourse because that's where the discourse is most directed. But well, one can generalize and see that it's not only a question of black-white, but this neoliberal post-racial discourse of individual actions leading to the results in one's life is pervasive, but most evident with, with, with uh, blacks. I'm also going to frame a lot of this in terms of Barack Obama, um, who I think is the Probably, he is the leader, at least for another year, of this face of post-racialism and neoliberal, neoliberalism. Okay. So the conventional discourse about racial disparity is a myth. It is a myth upheld by Democrats, Republicans, blacks and whites alike. In fact, it's a narrative that the nation's first black president has been advancing long before he even became president. At the 2004 Democratic National Convention, then candidate Barack Obama actually before he was candidate Barack Obama, Illinois Senator Barack Obama um, put forth a keynote address about harmony, bringing together red states, blue states, um, liberals and conservatives, and he mentioned race once. And when he mentioned race, he did it in the following context. He said, quote, go into any inner city neighborhood and folks will tell you government alone can't teach kids to learn. They know that parents have to teach 
that children can't achieve unless we raise their expectations, turn off the television sets, and eradicate the slander that says a black youth with a book is acting white. They know these things. So again, it's important that if we really want to enact any of these policies, that the conversation has to change. All right, so Obama uses this occasion of his first national platform to single out and chastise black youths and their families as the cause of their own underachievement. Obama reiterated, the, reiterated these themes in his 2004 keynote, um, More Perfect Union. This is when he was candidate Barack Obama. He says, quote, um, for the Amer African American community, the path to a more perfect union means embracing the burdens of our past without becoming victims of our past. It means continuing to insist on a full measure of justice in every aspect of American life. But it also means binding our particular grievances for better health care, better schools, and better jobs to the larger aspirations of all Americans. The white woman struggling to break the glass ceiling, the white man who's been laid off, the immigrant trying to feed his family, and it means taking full responsibility for our own lives. If we fast forward seven years to his 215, State of the Union address, and this will be my last Obama quote for the night. Um, the talking points remain the same, um, but rather than referencing Jeremiah Wright, he now references the Black Lives Matter movement. He says, quote, I want our actions to tell every child in every neighborhood, your life matters, and we are committed to improving your life chances as committed as we are to working on behalf of your own kids, um, I want, as our own kids, sorry. I want future generations to know that we are a people who see our differences as a great gift and that we're a people who value the dignity and worth of every citizen, man and woman, young and old, black and white, Latino, Asian, immigrant, Native American, gay, straight, Americans with mental illness or physical dis disability, everybody matters. So at best, Obama misunderstands the Black Lives Matter message and at worst, he attempts to co-opt it all together. Um, Obama's rhetoric, along with the voluminous dominant discourse on race, has remained remarkably consistent. It emphasized the same basic points, that in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, America has largely transcended its racial divide, and that whatever racial disparities remain are overwhelmingly the result of self-sabotaging actions or inactions on the part of blacks themselves. Hence, policy becomes oriented towards rehabilitation of black families. And the logic of austerity reigns. Why fund government agencies and programs that invest misallocated resources to irresponsible individuals and, at worst, create dependencies that further fuel irresponsible behaviors? Or instead of austerity, we end up with policies like my brother's keeper. Um, these are policies uh, that, which ignore the plight of young black women altogether and attempt to incentivize so-called defective black males, young black males, to be, em to be more employable rather than addressing the discriminatory labor market conditions that they continue to face. All of these policies are consistent with a neoliberal orthodoxy, both its focus on individuals and its faith in the free market. The underlying assumption is that as long as individual agents are properly incentivized, the market offers solutions to all problems, economic or otherwise. The ascendancy of blacks to the most elite positions of society are often put forth to make the case of this grand racial progress. These cases of black exceptionalism are meant to serve as examples of what individual or familial acts of perseverance and hard work can achieve. The problem with these convenient anecdotes is that they're self-fulfilling and they lack the systematic use of proper counterfactuals to empirically validate or invalidate their conjecture. We know nothing about all those individuals who did work hard and do all the quote right things and didn't achieve success in the labor market, for instance. Um, moreover, over the past 40 years, regardless of education, the black unemployment rate has remained roughly twice as high as the white rate. There's been only one year, 2000, in which the black unemployment rate has dipped below 8%. In contrast, there's only been four years in which the white rate has superseded 8%. Thus, if 8% is a demarcation of calamity, blacks are in a perpetual state of unemployment crisis. Um, these disparities are even larger when we examine wealth. In fact, wealth becomes the main tool to dispel the post-racial narrative. 
We know what wealth can buy in our society. We know that wealth can buy you access to a great education. It can buy you access to a job. It can buy you political influence. It can buy you a ticket out of jail. Um, so blacks and Latinos make up about 30% of the population, but own about 5% of the nation's wealth. When it comes to liquid assets, assets that can be readily converted into cash, black and Latino families are nearly penniless. The typical black and Latino family respectively have $200 and $340 in liquid assets. If we re re exclude retirement savings, the black liquid asset rate, what they have in the bank, is $25. Okay. Yeah. So in spite of these no enormous disparities in capital stocks, this course has focused primarily on education as the driver of upward mobility. The presumption is that if blacks were more responsible, made better financial decisions, and were more focused on education, they could get a good job, and they could have a pathway towards economic security. So there's a report that I co-authored with William Sandy Darity, Ann Price, Vishnus Schritterhand, and Rebecca Tibbet, in which we titled Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain, Why Studying Hard and Working Hard Isn't Enough for Black Americans. And in this report, we demonstrate that black families whose head graduated from college have $10,000 less wealth than white families where the head dropped out of high school. Um, it's also noteworthy that a good job is not the great equalizer either. either. Income poor white families have more wealth than middle income black families. And the typical white family whose head is unemployed has nearly twice the wealth of a typical black family whose head is employed full time. By the way, if you're in a black family where the head is unemployed, you have zero wealth. Um, in essence, education is not the anecdote for the enormous racial gap in wealth and employment. None of this is intended to dim diminish the value of education. There's clear intrinsic value, along with a public responsibility to expose every child to a high quality education from grade school through college. Um, I'm gonna skip this other report that we have that demonstrates it's not a question of investment in education because blacks, black families invest more with less when it comes to higher education. There are huge disparities in the wealth of black families who contribute to their child's education towards college than whites. I can cite you some enormous statistics, but I'll be fair to my panelists and not go through it. Okay. All of this directly follows from the neoliberal post-racial perspective where the free market, as long as individual agents are properly incentivized, it's supposed to be the solution for all our problems. The transcendency of Barack Obama becomes the ideal symbolism and the spokesperson for this, per for this perspective. His ascendancy becomes an allegory of hard work, merit, efficiency, social mobility, freedom and fairness, individual agency, and personal responsibility. Perhaps the greatest rhetorical victory of this paradigm is convincing the masses that implicit and unfettered markets is the American dream. The hope that even if your lot in life is subpar, with patience, individual hard work, you can turn your proverbial rags into riches. The reality is that policy needs to look beyond individual factors and investigate structural factors that preserve the relative status of dominant groups via intergenerational resource transfer as well as other exclusionary policies. To address the tenacious problem of inequality, we need a bold solution. One such policy is one that William Darity and I, along with Alan Aha and Daniel Bustillo, have advanced, and that's a federal job guarantee. Um, it would go a long way towards addressing racial disparities and, and building a more inclusive U.S. economy. It would offer the economic security of a living wage to all its citizens. Beyond physical infrastructure investments, like better transportation, like Clean, clean, clean jobs, or clean energy, sorry, green jobs, clean energy, um, that we so desperately need, it also would offer much needed investments in human capital infrastructure as well, like building new schools, like providing new hospitals, like the arts. Um, it would also offer the potential to give every American high quality childcare so that both genders have the ability to go to work without being burdened with child care. Um, the, I don't mean to say burden with child care. All right. uh, the, <laughs> I did say it. I shouldn't have just <laughs> I don't have any kids. Maybe that's what I'm <laughs> the, 
Right, so this public investment would provide tremendous economic benefit to the private sector as well. The Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps under the New Deal provide historical precedent where we had a great push in public sector works that stimulated the U.S. economy. The federal job guarantee would set an implicit floor on wages. It would curtail our need for minimum wage reform. It would set a minimum floor on employers providing health care provisions as well as any number of working conditions that are improvements for, for what workers have. Um, it would contend with the private, the private sector would have to contend with a federal job guarantee to attract workers, so it provides a minimum floor. It would dramatically reduce the need for all those pro things I mentioned, like, like minimum wage, for instance. Okay, and it would, here's the most, perhaps the most important part, it would empower workers so that they can bargain in their everyday live, lives by removing the threat of unemployment, which pretty much leaves workers at the mercy of employers, that threat of being destitute by employ, unemployment. So the deafening neoliberal post-racial discourse has defined fiscal budget reduction and economic growth, which often are ironically at odds with each other, as the nation's economic priorities, while economic equity fairness, and human capabilities have become a distant backseat. We need to change that discourse. A federal job guarantee would also be a major step in drowning out that rhetoric and instead providing all Americans with the tangible dignity and economic security of a productive job. All right. So we're going to hear from uh, Professor Chernova now, and she, she'll, she's an expert in um, public financing, so she'll tell you a little bit about like how, how we would pay for something like a job guarantee. But I also want to ask, because um, she's, w when you say a federal job guarantee, it sounds to a lot of people like it, it's a centralized program picking out where jobs are going to be and what the work's going to be, and that, that's kind of alienating to a lot of people. But um, Professor Chernova has a different, uh, more locally uh, governed uh, version of a job guarantee that she articulate so I'm going to ask you if you could sort of include yeah. a little bit about that vision yes no uh, thank you very much um, for the invitation and just really enjoyed the previous remarks I think what I'd like to do is I do want to talk about how we finance these programs like we have to uh, address the issue of the macroeconomics of these policies because at the end of the day we want them to do what we ask them to do and so I, um, I have been working a lot on the job guarantee, but my interest in, in, the, in the program is really um, to uh, rethink this program as an institutional vehicle for achieving certain socioeconomic objectives. And so I, I come to the table as a, as a friend of the basic income um, because we share so many goals. Um, I also come as a friendly critic of the basic income and a very particular basic income um, proposal um, just from the mo point of view of, of my macroeconomic training and my uh, work on, on public financing. So the few main points that I, I, I want to make is, uh, are the following, that uh, the job guarantee actually ends up fulfilling the objectives that the basic income has and the basic income as defined in the literature, um, the pure, uh, proposal actually has significant drawbacks and it doesn't uh, really um, provide income security. So I, that's the argument I want to run through. Now I need to qualify this. I've been talking to friends from um, the basic income guarantee networks from academia for the last 15, 20 years and we've been engaged in this dialogue um, and the, the issue is how do we, um, how do we um, eliminate economic insecurity but also, m my interest is how do we build a road to participation? So, um, which is the model? What do we want from the basic income? Um, what is the program that we're going to envision? The program that I've been critical of is the one that is permanent, that is universal, that is unconditional, and that provides living standard income to anyone, rich or poor. Okay, so I'm literally talking about the program that will provide $20,000 a year to every citizen in the United States. I, you know, I sympathize with the motivation behind it, but I think the macro macroeconomics will work against the model um, 
Okay. So uh, in, in part of my, my work, I study monetary systems. And um, um, one of the things that I'm interested in is uh, to talk about government spending by, by using the correct quote-unquote paradigm. We can't buy into the neoliberal economic theory of governments being short of financial resources and they can't achieve uh, object, their objectives. Um, the, the very, very basic premise, and, and this alone is a whole topic of discussion <laughs> that is, you know, it takes a while to flesh out, but the very basic premise is that modern economies are fiat economies. They use fiat currencies. And in modern economies, the fiat currency is a public monopoly. It's a basic, simple public monopoly. So the very argument that the government cannot fund a policy priority doesn't make sense, even on the face of it. Whenever there's a policy priority, governments that have sovereign control over their own currencies always achieve them. We have institutions like the Treasury and the Fed that coordinate and make whatever is necessary um, uh, uh, to finance those programs. So in other words, financing for the government, which is the monopoly issuer of the currency, is never a problem. Now, you know, a lot of people are saying, what are you saying? You know, are you, are you just saying we roll on the printing presses and let's just spend, spend, spend? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the way government spends is spends in its own resource, right? You and I have to earn the dollar. Uh, states have to, you know, tax the dollar. The federal government does not. The federal government provides the dollar. So that alone, you know, takes a while to sort of absorb and the implications of this. But um, we, we need to, um, uh, you know, talk about federal funding and, and the proper and the proper way. So the good news is um, that we can fund the programs. Right? Hey. <laughs> right? That's the good news. The financing is not the question. The bad news is that we have a currency system that's a fiat currency system where we have to worry about what that currency can buy. What's the value of that currency? And so policy then has to think about how government provides that currency so that it doesn't erode its, its value, okay? So the, you know, the simplest, simplest way that I can, um, I, I can, I, I can explain this is that um, basic income, just the policy of sending everybody a check in the mail for $20,000, very easy policy, kind of like Social Security, right? It's very easy, but that alone provides money for nothing. Right? In and of itself. And I know I don't want to use sort of the neoliberal, you know, frames that, you know, we don't value human life. I really don't mean that. What I mean is that normally currency is provided in exchange for real goods and services. And um, the, uh, the public, uh, public spending, in a sense, sets a conversion rate, if you will between the, what the currency can buy and the stuff that is produced out there in the public and the private sector, okay? So the, the basic distinction between these two policies is that in one instance, the money is quite literally free. In the other, it is in exchange for something. And what is that something? So that's where I'm, I'm very interested in, in talking about what do we want for that money, right? Um, the job guarantee, by, by providing a wage, you know, a, a $10 wage, let's say, um, you can say that, you know, um, every dollar is, what, six, six minutes of, of work or something like that, right? So in a sense, you are, you are situating the power of the currency in labor power. And I think that's, that's a powerful thing, that you are, um, you know what your money is worth exactly of six minutes of socially useful work. And that's what the job, the job guarantee uh, connects these two things. All of, the, all of the objectives of the basic income guarantee, of the provisioning of the um, inadequate public resources and services, et cetera, the job guarantee can do that by anchoring the value in the currency in people. So I basically, I have an, ar an article that makes the case that the pure, pure version of the basic income guarantee can be inflationary and potentially even hyperinflationary, which really is a disservice to precisely the people that we're trying to help. Part of the issue is opting out of the labor market, right? That's, that's uh, you know, one of the objectives. Um, but at the same time, the decommodification of labor is not a sufficient condition, not even necessary, I think, um, 
for the erosion of, of, of capitalism. And we're still embedded in a capitalist system within which we have to buy things. And so what ends up happening is that, you know, many of us would opt out, but we will still, in one way or another, have to consume with that basic income. And uh, you could see how, um, without changing the current power relations, production power relationships, you can, you can have firms simply uh, raise prices and uh, extract part of that basic income in the form of profit. So what I, so what I worry is that we, what we, so what would the basic income policy do? If there is a, if, there, if people are opting out, if supply is, is shrinking, but demand has increased because we all have now more purchasing power. Right? That in and of itself should cause inflation. Okay? If, however, the employer has to coax people back into the labor market, right? all of these you know, uh, fast food workers now are getting $20,000 a check, why would they leave their kids you know, and go to work instead of stay at home? Right? So you could potentially have this mass exodus, which is what we want. But at the same time, you've reduced supply. So if the employer wants to coax them back into the labor market, you have to increase wages, which is a good thing. And maybe you have to increase wages and add benefits because you, know, you have to beat that $20,000 income, right? But then your hamburger is not going to be $3, it's going to be $30. So suddenly, the income that we determined will give you your standard of living doesn't buy you the standard of living. Things are more expensive for rent, for food, and other stuff. So the basic income has not guaranteed you the minimum life. And we, as policy, committed to this policy, have to increase the basic income. So now the basic income is 25, maybe $30,000. So now the $30,000 bad jobs are experiencing this process. So in a sense, it's doing what we want it to do, like eliminate bad jobs and have uh, firms kind of increase wages. But it's doing it by, in, by a mechanism that erodes the purchasing power of the basic income. So you can have like a constant vicious spiral, uh, spiral um, um, that uh, is like a, you know, like a never-ending catch-up game. <clears throat> How do we deal with inflation in the modern world? Modern economies keep unemployment. They use unemployment to fight inflation. Essentially, they reduce people's income, they keep them hungry so they can't buy the stuff. Okay? Now, we don't want that. And what unemployment does is a counter-cyclical problem. When, when there is inflationary pressures, right, we, lot of, we lay off a lot of people. When there are deflationary pressures, you know, we, we try to hire people, or we give them unemployment insurance, right, just to keep them alive, right? So there is a counter-cyclical spending mechanism that tames inflation. The job guarantee has this virtue that that's the counter-cyclical spending, that when the economy is not doing well and people have lost even their good private sector jobs, they go in the public sector program where they get that income, but they are producing um, socially useful output. So I'll get to the point, to that point. So when the economy is shrinking, the job guarantee is expanding. When the economy is expanding, the job guarantee could be shrinking because people are moving to better paid jobs as the private sector demands those, those people. So you have a counter-cyclical mechanism, taming mechanism of inflation that is, does not exist in the basic income. So I don't want to be too, like, you know, too technical into that stuff, but I think that this, these two aspects are quite important in the way these programs function. So to me, uh, it, is, it is not at all a problem for us to marry the two proposals where we can say, here is an institution that values labor, that values social useful work, environmentally friendly um, jobs, and here's a program that puts the social motive ahead of the profit motive. And we will guarantee you a living income for that job. Are you ready and willing to work? Would you like income for the public purpose? Here it is. I recognize that not everybody can participate in, in, the, in this program, and there has to be some sort of income support for people for one reason or another cannot participate. And we may value those kinds of activities. Policy could explicitly state, OK, we want to support stay-at-home moms, and therefore we will provide unconditional income. They don't have to come and earn right, their wage, in a sense. So we, could, we can recognize that certain um, uh, groups of people will not want to work or should not work and um, uh, complement the employment 
but program, or the income from socially useful work with income um, that is uh, guaranteed. So basically, I just want to, um, I mean, there are a lot of things that I, I, I want us to discuss here, but I do see J job guarantee as that institution. It's that vehicle that brings people together. It is that vehicle that is attempting to fill social need, to begin building what is a very eroded social fabric in the United States, quite frankly, right? There are so many things that need to be done, and there are so many people that, that, that are can do them. And so the job guarantee is the coordinating mechanism. Um, it also recognizes work versus leisure. It kind of sets the standard of what a good job is. And the private sector has to match the pay package, the leisure, the, the vacation package. Um, and the same dynamic we, we then get to experience with private sectors meeting um, or rather losing their workers from bad jobs because there is a public option of a good job. Um, and finally, um, I just want to emphasize that uh, last point is that you have to change property rights. If you want to, if, if that's the issue, if the issue is capitalism, like it, you have to change property rights. You, it's not just allowing people not to work is not going to do anything if property rights are not changed. Capital is consolidated, it's concentrated, power, market power has been determined. I, I think that people would be marginalized if. Um, um, uh, if, if there aren't other enormous reforms to undermine capitalism, that's the goal. But the, pay, the job guarantee can create wealth and assets for people. You can use your cooperatives, you can use whatever other arrangements to create wealth. Um, I, I'll stop here. Thank Great. you. Excellent. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let me problematize some of those things for you. Um, Alyssa, the, um, the, the sort of most seductive claim in, in your advocacy for the basic income for me, in, in, from a, an environmental perspective, is that um, it, it, it takes pressure off of constantly having to keep up um, um, production and consumption. Jo more jobs, more consumption, and that those are, um, these are like major polluters. Uh, but I, I wonder if we're, if we're thinking of, like let's say we have both. Let's say that there's a job guarantee and then there's also a, a not $20,000 but like $5,000 basic income. It's just sort of an income support to provide people with the means of making leisure. Doesn't that increase consumption? Um, now we have possibly. Uh, yeah, I mean I don't think that, uh, that basic income is going to like is like the silver bullet for um, for decreasing consumption. I think what is important about it in, in this sort of context is um, in uh, is I guess it. I think taking pressure off the or challenging the notion that um, only people who do produce can uh, or who do produce can consume. But then um, I think just in I think breaking this this link in the cycle. Like I don't think that. Yeah, necessarily basic income, I think, um, will reduce consumption. I think it's, yeah, totally possible that um, there are, uh, that there are ways of providing. I mean, I think part of the point of basic income is to, like, allow people who don't have access to work to consume, right? Like, it is about, I don't think all consumption is bad either. Like, I don't want this to be a sort of, like, again, like, not a sort of an argument for austerity or for saying that, um, you know, nobody should consume anything, um, and I think certainly we um, need to figure out like how plenty of people, and I think this is particularly for the international argument, um, uh, how to support consumption for a lot of people, um, regardless of whether or not they have access to to work. Um, but I think that um, yeah, it's it's more directed at um, I think again like breaking the sort of. Uh, I guess like the producerist element of what we think of as um, what, like how consumption is possible. And then I think the way that that becomes like a form of, of sort of um, consumption blackmail where you have to consume to create jobs and you have to grow the economy to create jobs and sort of jobs um, or job oriented growth becomes the, the driving force of a lot of social policy, um, I think. Uh, and, um, and I think that that doesn't necessarily, um, 
have to be the case. I mean, I think one of the questions about job guarantee is that I think, I think a lot of it comes down to like how we are defining a job. Like, what is a job? What is work? Um, and I think that this is often really like the sticking point, and not even the sticking point. It's just sort of like how people are seeing things differently. Um, but I think there there are versions of a job guarantee that could just kind of continue a sort of um, jobs as a uh, in that sort of um, creating jobs because we need to like you know grow the economy and, and jobs are sort of a um, are the are the end towards consumption and there's a way that that could also be oriented differently um, but yeah so I bullshit think bullshit jobs <laughs> yeah no, bullshit jobs right um, so I think I mean I think and yeah so this is it's not like a silver bullet there it is not necessarily going to reduce consumption in all cases and um, is yeah is I think there are no solar bullets on sort of uh, environmental stuff so I guess I'll leave it at that. Good. Okay. Um, I have some political questions. Uh, keeping in mind that you two are both economists and public policy scholars and not politicians or political strategists, but uh, um, uh, in thinking about the sort of um, the racist assumptions and racist ideology that that kind of buttresses oligarchic. Um, uh, political movements. Like I'm thinking about the, the 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 main place when I think about President Obama's sort of class villainy is in um, education reform, um, and it, it's such a it's such a bald faced attempt to shift public resources into private ownership and control. And, and but the way that that's done is through this the the sort of mobilizing, motivating image is of like a lazy public school teacher who doesn't care about the kids, who just is getting, living high off the hog on the public dime. You know, this like super racist, sexist idea that's kind of at the core of the political movement that um, is specifically like this class-based movement. So I wonder, uh, th this is, I, I can't even like <laughs> really fathom, I can like barely fathom the amount of um, right-wing, especially racist, uh, politics that we would come up against in a serious political struggle for one of these or both of these um, uh, policy ideas. So I wonder what, what your thoughts are in terms of o overcoming that. I mean, we, we never successfully have. So we may find allies when we don't think we have allies. Um, in a lot of ways, the federal job guarantee is a conservative idea, right? It, it's one emphasizing work. Um, and then if we think about the the um, which, um, sorry, basic income, I think one of the key points that came up from Pavlina is that we need a progressive component to it. By just making it non-progressive, it can be inflationary, and it might enrich employers in the sense that you're, you're just providing them stimulus and they own the means of production. So if we are gonna have a, a progressive component to basic, in basic income, that's not very different from a conservative negative income tax. Right, so conservatives have proposed that. Milton Friedman was one of the, obviously what we have in mind is different than the amount that he had in mind, but um, it, it, you know. Charles it, Murray for crying out. Yeah, so, so, you know, we may, I think if we're able to shift the conversations, right, the ideas themselves aren't so liberal, right? So we're, we're talking about things that conservatives may be able to latch on. I mean, that's the short answer. Um, the long answer is that it, it's not a Democrat, it's not a Republican or Democratic idea. It's as if we went through a shift, right? So we're economists. When economists shifted from a political economy discipline to one of an econ a science, economic science, the orthodoxy of the market became almost dogmatic or religion that it's not even questioned. If we're allowed to question the discipline and talk about political economy in a sense that what is the best thing to leverage human capabilities in conversations like that, then I think we have a shot at, at the policies. Until we change that, we, we don't have a shot because it, it seems like foolishness. If yeah. it, okay, so you know, I'm always very cautious about um, how you frame uh, the question. I don't even think I'm framing it the right way. I use frames that are you associate with you know conservative thinking, neoliberal thinking, but I, I agree that we gotta look for allies, but I, I don't think we should sell ourselves short and try to show how our program really fulfills what a conservative, like the punitive features of the program that a conservative may want. Like somebody may say, you know, you'd better show that you're disciplined and you come to work and you, you're fired, you know, we take away your right, your basic right, 
because X, Y, and Z. I mean, there is quality control. There can be various ways of doing, of doing this, but there is, we don't want it to be work fair. That's number one. Okay. Can, now, can you, can you um, just define work fair a little bit? Uh, just work fair is when you take away somebody's unemployment insurance and they show that, they ask them to demonstrate they're deserving. This is what the UK did with young people, like you know, youth uh, support, income support, basic income. They told them, okay, you know, you've been unemployed for too long. You know, get up, get off the couch, and go find a job, or come and work here for us. Otherwise, we take away unemployment insurance. Is that that's not? We it. did it here in New York City, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. With menial jobs, right? We're not, so we're not after, right. not talking about menial right. jobs. We're talking about productive yeah. jobs. So the, where the, the New Deal was fair work, like we believe that people just did not have the opportunity to work, and we guarantee it in that sense so so that's number one but in terms of political strategy um, there are there are a couple of ways that I think about this the first thing is to show that people are already in the public sector the the mass fallout of unemployment is uh, we pay for it you know we pay for it with uh, with the erosion of the social fabric of our environmental destruction with with um, uh, so all the socioeconomic problems that are related to unemployment it's, we just have a welfare state that pays for unemployment and the associated costs. It's very expensive. So you can, you know, in terms of human life, in budgets, if that's what you're concerned with, right? So, so you know, I just say there's a better way of doing it by valuing human life, by valuing social production. So that's, I think, the first thing. There's another strategy, though, in the U.S. I'm not sure it's going to work. Is the human rights strategy? You know, the um, you know, in India they pass a job guarantee on the basis of a basic human right. We recognize that everybody should have gar guaranteed access to a job, and we have a law. So you know, they're trying to you know really attack this program, but it's kind of hard. You know, once you enshrine it into law, then you kind of have to make you know you've made a commitment, and you have to then make it workable. How is that program going in India? It's a country that I think of as being quite poor, or many people. And it's poor. enormous, right? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, talk about an intractable there's that, there's that problem. Fo there's that, that picture of the yeah. globe, and they have a little circle that gets like m most yeah. of India and China, and that's like 60% yep. of the global yep. population. Exactly. I mean, talk about it. So yeah, you will find you know many many critics of the program, but there the program is is relatively young, but there there are uh, studies that are coming out that are showing uh, the benefits it has on on people who are participating. So it's a little difficult in terms of you know the the local the states in um, the challenges to create those jobs. So they're kind of delaying. They are not always creating the jobs, even though they are guaranteed. The payments are not coming. So actually, India is innovating and in making a payment system that uh, directly debits. Uh, the recipient, so it's kind of like a basic guarantee. But then they have to also provide the job opportunity, right? When people go to the to, to the municipality. But some studies are showing a student of mine that was doing research on this that, for example, the wage differential between men and women shrunk as a consequence of the program, and there was a compression at the lower end of wages as well between men and women in the private sector as well. There's another study also that uh, actually there are two studies on. Uh, small environmental effects, uh, the projects, uh, you know, in terms of like uh, water projects and reforestation projects, some uh, my, uh, small infrastructure investment projects uh, in the poorest of the poorest com communities. So, the, you know, I think, I think there's a lot more that you, you know, we, you know, we, we can look to. Number one, they need to, you know, really improve the program to provide jobs for all and then study it. Um, can I ask you a little bit about the politics too? Because uh, obviously the same question arises. I mean, the, the big impediment that I could see to getting a basic income is people's objection to giving black people free money. I mean, like that's like the, the major anxiety of a huge amount of um, this country. So I want to ask about that, but I also want to ask, I want to highlight a thing about a basic income that Dr. King uh, uh, emphasized in his advocacy of it, which is that, which is that it gives free money to black people, which is to say that it provides people who are struggling for justice, cash to devote to that cause. So, so that it, um, in a sense, once the program is implemented, it then sets you up for further more radical transformation. So I, I guess I wanna ask about the prospects for, for the strategy behind talking about and advancing a basic income, and then what you foresee, if we imagine that that's some kind of transitional program toward a more socialist uh, uh, economy, what, what you see as the, the sort of um, the fallout or the next step. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, it's, I mean, it's a good question. I think that a couple of things tend to come up in the politics of basic income, and one of them um, is what Derek raised about there being a lot of right-wing support for basic income. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a sort of suspicion of, um, you know, well, if Milton Friedman liked it, can it possibly be okay? Um, and, you know, there are versions of basic income that are very, um, that I wouldn't support, that are, you know, like the sort of give a check and that's it, you know, to erode the rest of the welfare state um, that we have. Like, I sort of that's when basic income and I part ways. Um, but, uh, you know, the other one is obviously the sort of um, America will never give, um, in general, people money for free. I think, yeah, you're right, especially black people money for free. There is a lot of um, the, the sort of, um, and people of color and women or working class people in general, like, um, don't deserve money for free. And, um, you know, the, the work ethic of um, America in particular is very, very strong and very um, racialized. Um, and uh, so I think, yeah, that is, I think, a, a, a major um, challenge. Um, and, but I think also, um, so I guess I have a couple of things that I think here. One is um, that I do look to, um, I think that there are also places to look for, um, I guess, like maybe political inspiration um, to organizations like the National Welfare Rights Organization, um, uh, which is led mostly by black women um, fighting for um, benefits and rights um, and, you know, for dignity during um, particularly the Reagan era when, uh, you know, we start to see especially the rhetoric of things like welfare queen um, emerging and cre being um, established. And um, it is not my term to reclaim, but I would love for welfare queen to be reclaimed as like a term that is not. Spelled, spelled K-W-E. <laughs> yeah, something. I don't know. I mean, like there's, um, it's like obviously a, a myth with very, you know, um, like derogatory uh, intention. But I think that like the idea of living uh, decently without working too hard is not a bad one. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think that, that looking to, um, to working class women of color who have organized to um, to stop things like workfare, to um, to protect welfare rights, and to say like that um, you know we do deserve this, and to to sort of um, I guess reject the the sort of you know stuff around like the who are the deserving poor um, is at least a you know um, a, a sort of like a resource for sort of thinking about um, about politics and who is at the center of it. Um, but also I think, I guess like this is where the, the universal um, comes in and um, universal programs tend to just generate a lot more support than um, means tested ones. And um, I think that uh, the, you know, as I said, there's sort of um, between unemployed people uh, underemployed people, um, and even employed people who realize that, you know, I think maybe feel less secure <laughs> in that, like, perpetual employment. Um, that's, like, another potential, I think there is, um, yeah, the potential to sort of organize very broadly, um, uh, and to link, you know, I think a lot of left politics tends to be about organizing workers, um, and the unemployed, you know, we should, like, try to get them employed somehow. Um, but, uh, you know, do you think basic income provides some resources for linking um, organizing of the unemployed and like connecting um, unemployed people to people who do have jobs um, and, uh, or who maybe have jobs that are not, you know, sufficient in some way. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's a little vague, but I think there, there are, you know, there's some potential there. Um, and I guess like the last part is the sort of the, I guess the visionary element of it that I, that I think is, um, you know, uh, I guess like the third, I, I sort of pointed out two things that people always say about basic income and the third is like, well, that's just like never, it's just sort of utopian to vision, envision like, um, a world of working less and like, um, it probably is at this moment. Like, I don't actually think that basic income is probably going to pass tomorrow and we will all sort of have, um, you know, like time for what we will and all of this um, immediately. But I think that actually when you talk about it to people, uh, I've, I've been sort of surprised at how much it does resonate, like the sort of desire to have, um, you know, uh, I think to contribute socially and to do the things that I think actually Job Guarantee is also aiming for, but, but also to have like um, time, yeah, time for what we will, um, to have uh, real freedom as another um, advocate of basic income has put it, to have like a, you know, support to, to choose one, one's own life. And so I think that um, 
utopian though it may be, and I am not an economist, I'm a political theorist, so take that for what you will. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think trying to, to talk about what, um, you know, what features we do want for ourselves <clears throat> and collectively and, and trying to just envision um, like how our uh, working and non-working lives could be different um, is, uh, is like a place to at least um, see some potential in basic income. And I guess the very last point I'll make is that I think that in, again, like this is a US specific discussion that we've mostly been having, but I think, you know, internationally, there are a lot of places where most people actually are unemployed. And so like actually the political power is, is much more behind something like basic income. Um, and there's some like, I think very interesting politics around like, um, yeah, distributive politics around things that are uh, around the idea of basic income and in places where like being unemployed is not the exception, but um, in fact the norm. And um, that might be another place to look for, for how to, um, uh, what kinds of political organizing and, and strategy um, are, are possible um, or what kinds of rhetoric people there are using and things like that, so. I, I think that, the, that you're right that the sort of utopian aspect is, um, it, it, it like is a turn on to people. You can like see once they get their heads around like everybody gets a check. That it's it it's uh, it's very exciting to people. Um, uh, it makes for a better meme, I think, than a job guarantee in that way. I think, and I think that that um, I, I showed this recently in a study that I did that was extremely scholarly. It was a Twitter poll. Uh, probably make the public policy scholars over here bristle. But I was like, yeah. Well, what do you want? Fight. The text was fight. Job guarantee, basic income. Basic income won hugely. And I... I they all your uh, followers. I don't... Yeah, well, I have followers <laughs> in both sides. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I wanted to ask you about that, about... So, so the... I, I think... L let me, let me um, add one more thing into the mix. One thing that I think appeals to a basic income, especially among young people who... Um, perhaps like me, uh, have never had a staff job anywhere with a salary and benefits. I mean, I, I just go from project to project, temporary employment, contract work here and there. Um, that's kind of the economy that uh, we live in, and I, I like that kind of freedom. And a basic income speaks to me because it allows that for that sort of flexibility. Um, and I, I wonder um, how... Uh, articulate a job guarantee for me in a way that, that is in that frame and not in the frame of the sort of old school way of doing it where you go to work nine to five, five days a week, and then you clock out and blah, 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 like, which just isn't how a lot of people, I think, live or want to live at the moment, but uh, which is, I think, maybe more fitting for a job guarantee, or maybe I'm wrong. To, so anyway, speak, speak to that. Do you, yeah, I want to take it. Want, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, go first. So Jesse, you're not representative of everybody. I know. <laughs> <laughs> There is intrinsic value in a job. There are plenty of unemployed people when polled would like to be working and doing something that, that they may consider productive, right? So there, there are some people who really want, want that. Um, I think that the conversation we're having about freedom, about um, basic income giving you that ability to make choices, that's really about assets and wealth, right? If you really want freedom and you want to talk about ability to make choices in your life, it's not income. Income meets your day-to-day -day needs. Wealth is the thing that allows you to be transformative, to come up with a new profession, to move from project to project. And I think, uh, you know, again, a, a policy that Sandy and I have been talking about, we call them baby bonds, where imagine every child is endowed with an account at birth, and that that account will be progressively funded, so that if you're from the most wealth-poor family, you can get upwards to $50,000 in the account, and if you're the son of Oprah Winfrey, you can get a nominal account of, say, $500. With the app, right, I won't get into all the details. The, the average account could be $20,000. Um, now, we can add a layer of, of paternalism to it to be productive, protective of, of people's assets by saying that that money, when you become an adult, gets used towards some asset-enhancing endeavor like a debt-free education, the purchase of a home, uh, a, a seed capital for a new business. I think the key element is we need programs to give every American some seed capital. We can think about that seed capital as in the form of public assets. So if we had um, a system where college higher education was free at the point of delivery for all Americans, that could be an example of a public asset that could be used towards giving people freedom and choices. But you know, if we don't go, want to go that route, we can give people private accounts. 
but we need some mechanism, some policy. If, you know, I'll say this last thing, which is rhetorical, a, a sound bite. Um, a capitalist society where large segments of the population lack capital is a cruel society that just locks in inequality. Universal seed money, we can call it venture communism. <laughs> as long as Jesse is the spokesperson, we'll never get the policies passed. <laughs> Well, all right, um, I can't top that, but uh, I don't have a cool quote, but um, here's, here's how I think about it. So you say, this is the kind of economy we live in. Like, this, we have to give this up. Like, just because this is the kind of economy we live in doesn't mean we can't have a different economy. So like, a lot of the conversation about basic income is like, well, there simply aren't enough jobs. There simply aren't good jobs. There simply aren't 95 jobs, and I don't want the, that's fine, but let's, you know, we can create enough jobs, right? That's basically the, uh, you know, one aspect. So part of the freedom would be, yes, assets, but also the ability to move uh, from job to job. And I like the beverage, uh, the great British social reformer uh, definition, there should be more, more vacancies than are job seekers. So, it, so in a sense, you could have labor mobility, genuine labor mobility, when there are plenty of things to do in the public sector that may seem desirable. But also the public sector sets the standard. They can define what a job is. You know, I've seen how uh, the Argentina did their job guarantee program, and they literally people propose their own projects, and and they determine their own hours, and many of them work many more hours than they were paid for, and they got seed money precisely to buy some capital, like you know, sewing machines or just some other basic things where they started their own businesses. So. This is the best kind of microfinance. It's a grant. It's not a loan where you have to repay you know, the money. You, it's seed money that gets you off your feet. Not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur. and Not everybody's going to have a successful business. But people would like to still work. Um, and uh, we, can, we can give them various options in the public sector. The other thing is about polls is that um, you know, polls show that income is important, but it's not nearly as important all, all the way on the top of reasons why people like to work. Doing something is super important uh, for most people, and being part of a community, um, you know, uh, working in a, you know, learning things. But, so I think, uh, you know, like income, you know, the, the one poll that I'm referring to in Argentina was like the fifth or seventh, sixth, seventh. Thing, seventh thing that they, you know, people liked so many other aspects of these kind of, um, projects. Um, so I, I think that, you know, there, there could be many jobs for you, Jason, <laughs> <laughs> that you might like to do. Um, just a plug for Pavlina's work on the HEFES program in um, Argentina, which you should look up, and also her short paper at the Levy Institute called uh, Full Employment Through uh, Social Entrepreneurship, where um, she sort of fleshes out this idea, um, not, not fully, but briefly, of uh, communities proposing and designing their own projects and then getting funding from the federal government, which as she mentioned is not budget constrained in the same way as other political and corporate entities are. So, I, so highly, highly recommend on that, that actually. Yeah. So I guess I'm just curious, because that sounds a lot kind of like a basic income to me, frankly. If you're like proposing your own project, you're, you know, you're, you're coming up with the, the, thi you're the sort of impetus and basically doing what you want with a grant, like that sounds sort of like, you know, a basic income in a lot of ways. And I do think like, there's a sort of sense that like, oh, well, if you give people a basic income, they're just gonna like sit around and that's bad. And I think both like on the one hand, like, well, you know, if people like, I don't want to sort of say it, like, well, that's, uh, that's like the worst thing that you can do. But like also, um, I do think that, you know, I think you're right that people want to contribute to the communities in ways, but I, I guess I don't see why providing income would you know um, would stop people from doing that right? Like it seems like that is also I guess like again this is like a definition is it a job or is it a you know basic income grant? Um, and you know some of that also comes down to like where we're deciding which projects you know are are viable and okay yeah. you get the grant or you get the grant and then you can decide for yourself which projects you want to partake in or your community can. So yeah. I guess I think like here again like I feel like sometimes the the discussion is really definitional in some way and you know, maybe maybe calling it a job is a better, like, political strategy, um, uh, and that just may be the case, but uh, but I do think that sometimes these things are, like, it's very blurry <laughs> what the boundaries are. I mean, uh, so there are, 
probably slight differences in the way we envision the way it would actually work. The way I see it is that, um, well, the program is, acts as a, as a mediator uh, amongst us all on what our policy priorities are and how we can collectively achieve them. So in some sense, there has to be a, co a conversation about you know, what do we need to do first? The environmental problems? Do we need to you know, clean up the Hudson River? You know, what, what exactly do we need to do? And there has to be a, um, a, a vehicle, an institution that propels this conversation. Providing just a check to people doesn't really kickstart that conversation. It might help my community and my friends with our community garden and all of that, but it might not help the other you know, communities that don't even have these resources. To even be, they don't even know where to begin, right? So that's, that's how I, I see the, the, the program as, as, uh, as this place to come and to uh, truly nurture participation rather than allow on communities to, you know, some will be very uh, effective and others will still not be able to build the assets that they will need. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree this. Public goods that aren't being produced by the private sector, both in terms of physical infrastructure as well as human capital infrastructure. I think childcare is a great example in the sense that people pay high prices for oftentimes um, low quality childcare. Why can't we have a first-rate childcare system for everybody, right? Have universal access. One, one other point I wanted to make is that, Jesse, when you started off with the question, it, I just want to add some clarity. The way we conceive of the federal job guarantee is federally financed. It has to be at the federal level, but the distribution does not necessarily have to come from the federal level. There could be programs set up where local communities can appeal to, to the federal government for the ability to distribute these jobs, for example. You could have a system designed where nonprofits could even be the distributor as well as state and local governments of whatever might be needed for particular communities. I, I, I like that. When, on the days when I like a job guarantee more than a basic income, it's, it's that sort of coordinating factor. There's a good um, analogy for it in Megan Erickson's um, Jacobin release uh, that, whose title I'm totally forgetting. What's it called? Class war. Class war. Um, where she, she sort of contrasts the, um, the sort of Montessori, Waldorf, kind of like hyper-individualized, do, do whatever you want model of education, which I actually have quite a bit of regard for, with public education, because in public education, you have to learn to cooperate. You have to learn that like sometimes the whole class has to shut up, and like it's time, you know? Like there, there is, there's like a kind of like social cohesion to it that I, that I think is I think in that analogy, a basic income is much more the, the sort of Waldorf to the, the job guarantees uh, public school. I want to ask one more question uh, of, about JG, and then we can open it up to everybody. Um, and the question is about work hours, uh, because uh, you know, for for like a century and a half, the the a, a primary socialist goal was less work. Um, and I wonder what you imagine the mechanism, like would these be unionized workers, these, these job guarantee workers? Or what mechanisms do you imagine? Like let's say we had a job guarantee tomorrow. If, look, if there were a job guarantee that enshrined 40 hour work week for all the job guarantee recipients, I would, be, I would take it tomorrow. But is there a, is there a, a, a what, what can you imagine as a mechanism for shortening work hours as let's say, um, you know, automation takes care of more and more functions in society to, to progress toward a more leisureful society? Or is that a, a priority for you? Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely, I, these are not competing at all. And in fact, we should be working less. We're, we're completely overworked, without a doubt. You know, what's interesting is that government policies usually set the standard for the private sector. Um, it, wage policy is very clear. Um, how pay practices in the public sector are, you know, uh, picked up by the, pri emulated by the private sector. Um, so the same thing with working hours. Pay a living wage for a 35-hour week. Let that be, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the sanctioned full employment plus guaranteed vacation some other benefits, you know, uh, health benefits, retirement benefits, and that was one big complaint of the Argentinians. They said, you know, we're working here, but we don't get social security. Um, you know, this, um, you basically provide the package that has to be then matched by the private sector. I mean, public sector jobs provide some of the better working conditions compared to the private sector jobs. So I certainly agree that it provides... Probably the because of unions. Well, this is the second part. Unions aren't prohibited under the job guarantee. 
So if there are public sector unions that need to form, they form. So there are two layers of accountability, at least in theory. There are the possibility for labor bargaining through unions, but the government is, in theory, supposed to be accountable to the people. They're elected officials, and it's, it's supposed to be the people's government. So um, that, that's another layer of accountability that's not in the, the private sector by which we could set a, a floor on working conditions to sanction the private sector to, to at least provide what the federal government provides. Excellent. Um, is there like one last oh, thing. please. You know, when we talk about health insurance reform, for example, yeah. the public option, right? So this is an implicit public option, right? So if we, if the federal job guarantee provides health insurance in the same way that other public sector employees get health insurance, that that curtails the need for health insurance reform, right? If there's an implicit floor on which you back, back door single payer. Mm -hmm. um, is there, Colin? Is there a, a way that we want to yeah. kind of solicit questions, or do you so want to be in charge of the, the mic? The ideal would be for people to come up to the front uh, to grab the mic, but don't bring it ahead of you. Uh, but I, I realize things are a little tight, so if you do need to ask questions at the back, just shout it, shout it right out. Yeah, or Jesse, you can repeat it. Oh, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll be the least able to hear it. I'll do my best. Turn on my spidey here. Yeah, all the way in the back. So the, the culture, it sounds like you're asking about the cultural change on both ends, both the cultural change that would be necessary to implement one of these programs or both of these programs, and then the cultural changes that would result, like ha, w ha, the, the, the reduction in alienation or the, the, um, the progression toward fully automated luxury communism, so-called. Want me to go first? Um, so I think the cultural change really has to be with regards to the conversation, the discourse, Right, that is, that's what's ne necessary. We need to get out of the, the dogma of markets being supreme no matter what the outcome is. Um, it's wrong, it's not empirically substantiated. People just say things. They say <laughs> things like, with no accountability, right? Black people are lazy, right? What gives you the in information that, that a people, black people have ever been lazy, right? You, we could find anecdotes anytime. But it's without rigor, those anecdotes or those cases. So um, the, the way we have to culturally change that is, is, one, keep beating them with evidence, right? When we cite the statistics, I think wealth becomes some of the primary evidence to, to cite when we talk about how people, this, this system of meritocracy is not really driving people's outcomes, right? We often think of, of things going into wealth like education, income leading to wealth when a lot of times it's the other way around, having wealth leads to bet those better outcomes. So this becomes some of our strong ammunition. So we need to change that discourse. Um, I think that's the, the, most, the most important thing we can do. Yeah, and I will only add, and you need a political strategy. Maybe the culture won't change. You know, you won't have the full prerequisites for the culture to change to be behind. Um, the program. But then what we have seen is that people get behind these programs once they see how they work. There have been polls taken when framed a certain way that close to half Americans would support something like a federal job guarantee. Yeah. 
right. or, or more actually. More, the, more than more, zero. Like, you know, when Jesse did his uh, piece in the Rolling Stone, like the five proposals, I should say that the job guarantee was well ahead of the income guarantee. And you framed it as a social security, which is a very popular program. So if you had framed it as a universal basic income, I'm curious. But then there were the Gallup, uh, Russell Sage, and a bunch of others uh, had 58% uh, to all the way to 77%. And the Progressive cam Change Campaign Committee or whatever yeah. had 77 And they asked the question, what if the federal government funded it? Like, in, you know, if they had appropriated a budget. So they asked it without it uh, and then with it, because often when people, you know, hear government budgets, they're like, oh, you know, you're going to explode the debt and all of these myths out there that we can't afford it. The support was equal. Um, I think it's a, a great question, and I think it sort of um, points to this interesting tension where I think the cultural changes, um, you're talking about point in sort of different directions for these in some sense, and that like I think um, the the questions around you know the, the undeserving and the deserving poor, which are like very racialized, um, tend to favor that kind of cultural, um, I guess, uh, sense that we have like tends to favor something um, like a job guarantee, which at least has a sense that you like work, you do some like, you know, honest work for your money, you're not just getting something for nothing, you're not just like lazing around or whatever. Um, and so I think that that piece of the cultural, I guess, you know, and, and I agree that I think that like, you know, political strategy um, will sort of probably have to preempt like a total cultural shift, but still I think, um, the cultural, I guess, dynamics of both of these are difficult, but I, I do think that they sort of <laughs> tend towards, um, or are more favorable for something like um, a job guarantee um, because of all these questions around work ethic that you raise. Um, but then, of course, that points in the opposite direction of this idea of unalienated labor that you are sort of, um, or that, you know, I think the job, not that all work, um, and I think I think there are elements of the job guarantee that are trying to, to push against that and to sort of say that people are like, can, um, you know, uh, choose together um, or or coordinate together some sort of like socially um, valuable work. But you know, I think still like the job that you have to go to um, is going to be uh, in in some ways like it is always alienated, and maybe that's not always bad. Like you know, I think that there are like some good things about like alienated labor is not always like the the greatest demon. Um, but I certainly think that that um, is one of the things that is also appealing about um, about basic income as a sort of aspirational cultural change or something. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's tricky to, to navigate that. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting in, th in terms of thinking about the sort of, I guess, cultural framing or something of basic income, um, I mean, it's interesting that um, framing the job guarantee as social security is, is that? What no, you said? Oh, okay, right. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that's, okay, right. That's, I was going to say, that seems like a strange, <laughs> that seems much more like basic income, right? Yeah, okay, so, um, but I guess one of the, one of the ways it's often been um, framed as, 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 or like implemented is through like resource wealth. Um, so in, in America, um, Alaska is the sort of um, paradigmatic case, I guess, where like Alaskan oil wealth is, you know, everyone gets a dividend from that. Um, some of the, a lot of the stuff happening in Southern Africa is tied to like mineral wealth and some sense that this belongs to like all the people. Um, and I think that has a slightly different dynamic than like, um, or I guess there's a sort of, impl the, the initial thought is that we all, own this thing, we all own this resource, it is a like shared common resource, and so like we are getting our share of it rather than like we are, we deserve this or not based on some sense of like whether you've worked enough for it or like whether you've produced enough to get it. Um, and so I think that's really interesting and um, particularly coming from a sort of environmental um, justice perspective, it's, I mean, I think, you know, there's the, the problem being that it tends to be tied to extractive industry, obviously, like, you know, incentivizes more um, extractive uh, activity, but I think there are also ways to tie it to something like, you know, carbon tax or two shared commons that are, um, that we say, like, okay, we all own, you know, the atmosphere and any sort of um, any tax on, on polluting the atmosphere should go to like the people who share an ownership of that. So I think there's some like interesting ways that, um, so potentially thinking about getting, uh, or like having a different cultural sense around like where, what we, um, what this dessert is and like what we should, should get from the things that like, um, we collectively 
uh, do our own. I'd just like to put in a word for the best thing I know about that <coughs> can change um, cultural conditions and shift the terrain of what is politically possible at the highest levels, which is social movements. Um, I, I don't think that we would see anything like the traction that the Sanders campaign is getting without having been preceded by Occupy Wall Street. I think the movement for black lives is shifting the cultural terrain of especially um, uh, of, I mean, I think that the simply the claim that black lives matter confronts in a really earnest way a lot of the sort of racist ideology that we were talking about earlier is a big impediment. So I think that these things, the climate movement, the immigration justice movement has obviously had enormous um, uh, political effects. So mass movements that, that center on direct action I think are, uh, um, are our best hope for shifting that kind of cultural terrain. Other questions? I'm being deliberately progressive about this. Yeah, right there. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. A good note. Can, can we can we talk about um, uh, valorizing domestic work and, and childcare? I, I I think of a, a locally run job guarantee as accommodating like babysitting circles, for instance, or uh, like domestic work co-ops or something like that. That's exactly what happened in Argentina. Like people, um, you know, created their jobs projects, and then right next door there was like a daycare center, or it was in proximity to a daycare center. Um, and, you know, like moms and dads, they, you know, they equally said it wasn't just moms, you know, I can go and see my kids for lunch. Uh, it's right here. I don't have to commute an hour, you know, pick up my kid and to then go back to my, you know, factory job, etc. So um, there are a couple of things. Um, yeah, when we say unemployment, we just are talking about somebody who wants a job and can't find one. That's it. A simple definition, man or woman. Um, now, uh, the job guarantee uh, envisions support for um, uh, unpaid, what is now unpaid work, right? Household work or any other socially useful work that is not uh, commodified. And so like a universal child allowance to me is an essential prerequisite to add on to uh, the benefit package. Um, so um, then the, uh, the other thing is that, you know, it, here's, I think this is where uh, the question is, you know, you give a check, no questions asked, and then that allows people freedom to X, Y, and Z. 
this is what I question. We're talking about substantive freedom. We're talking about not just the ability to spend your dollars, but we're talking about the removal of obstacles and empowering you to do X, Y, and Z. So when you talk about the universal basic income, I, I almost see that there has to be something else. Like there's got to be the how. Like how do people actually, you know, fulfill their own destinies? Like what, what would the market do that is not already doing to provide them with what they need? Like, the market is not going to solve those problems. It's not going to solve the, the multiple aspects of economic insecurity, even if you provide the check. So, so we need the institution. And that's why you know, I, I think that um, it, it's not just freedom. You're looking for substantive freedom. You are, and, and that's you know, following Amartya Sen and Amartya Nisbam. You know, it follows three criteria. You recognize what people want, and it's not just income. Then you provide those opportunities. Uh, maybe they want jobs, maybe they want decent childcare, maybe whatever. And then you remove obstacles from taking advantage of those opportunities. Provide the job in close proximity. Provide the public transportation so that people can take advantage of that economic opportunity. Um, and on and on. So I think even freedom needs to be thought of as a more broad, uh, uh, broad context. Mm. So I, I want to give three points in response. One, the federal job guarantee would be inclusive of things like child care and elder care and are meant to provide public provisions that eliminate barriers that might have traditionally led to um, inequities around gender lines or racial lines. I'd also add that the federal job guarantee is intended to help remove stigma for stigmatized groups. If you were formally incarcerated, you would have right to a guaranteed job if you're black and facing labor market discrimination, you'd have right to a guaranteed job. If you are a woman and face labor market discrimination, if you are of a certain sexual orientation, whatever, the, the job guarantee is, as it says, a guarantee. And that not only gives them access to jobs in the pu private sec public sector, it should sanction the private sector as well. Um, the last point I want to make is that with regards to basic income, if it does not have a progressive component, I'm actually against it. I'm against it because I think it might act, it will, one, be potentially inflationary and not have the real impacts that we might desire for it to be. And two, I think this is a, a far worse concern, is that it might actually exacerbate inequality for a lot of the reasons that you brought up in your presentation, which is you might very well be diverting more resources to people that have greater, need, greater means um, to build up even larger inequalities or structures that perpetuate their hierarch hierarchical position on, on the class ladder. Just to give an example, I, I completely agree. If you provide $20,000 check to everybody, what is the wealthiest person going to do? They're going to put it in their stock portfolio, right? And it earns interest and interest on interest and interest. So, it, but the, the poor is going to try to get food that maybe became more expensive now and rent, right? That is now a little more expensive. So it's, yeah, there are inequities there. So yeah. Someone referred to it as a democracy of consumers and an aristocracy of producers. That's a nice way to present it. I mean, you, you can also think about who owns the means of production. So when people think about trade models, sometimes uh, just giving a, developed country, a developing country a cash transfer without elevating their means of production actually could lead to a miserating growth where they might grow, but the other country will grow at a faster rate. So if certain populations don't own the means of production and you stimulate the economy in a nominal way, then you very well could exacerbate it inequality. So that's a concern. Um, can I ask you to weigh in on, on the, the question of um, valorizing invisible work. I know that we, we were at a conference that Derek was also at where you spoke on a panel with Kathy Weeks who focuses on this a lot and I, I just wonder what your remarks are on that. Yeah, um, I guess I think that uh, this is, I guess again, some one of the appeals of basic income for me is that I think that, um, you know, while I appreciate that I think job guarantee can also, you know, is, uh, in, in a progressive form um, oriented towards supporting a lot of kinds of work that are currently um, under recognized or invisible. Um, I do think that this, I think this discussion just highlights like how, um, you know, uh, 
unclear, I guess, the, the line between waged work and unwaged work, recognized work and unrecognized work, visible labor and invisible labor is. And um, the, you know, I think there are many, many kinds of activities that go into, um, again, social reproduction to recreating our, you know, and sustaining our communities. And some of those can be, I think, easily um, identified and turned into jobs and sort of like treated as such. And some of them can't. And I think that um, the, you know, a, a basic income does, I think, recognize that that there there are many ways that we all are contributing to our communities, even if we don't have um, a like uh, a socially recognized job, um, and that I think does try to, in some ways, combat the stigma. I mean, ideally, I guess, would try to combat the stigma also of of not having um, you know a traditional job, um, and I think that uh, yeah, I mean, it, of course, it's not enough alone, like. I, I, you know, <laughs> I don't think that, that um, you know, I guess in, in response to the initial question, which um, I don't, I hope I didn't say that I think, um, you know, the idea of the basic income is, is a check that is no strings attached in terms of being given out. I don't, if I said that it was a mistake, I meant to say um, a check that has, um, that is intended to replace um, other forms of like public provision, which I don't. That is what I wouldn't support is um, uh, you know the check that's sort of like okay here's your you know twenty thousand dollars a year but there's no go buy um, healthcare with it go buy healthcare go buy you know a car or what, you know there's no more like any sort of other public provision um, and so yeah of course like we need many other things to um, enable us to have substantive freedom I don't disagree with that in the slightest um, and you know I think things like the means of production um, yeah. I, I again, I don't disagree here. I, I don't necessarily see that like a job guarantee is seizing the means of production either, um, except for the ones that the federal government already controls. But um, uh, I do, um, yeah. I think that the the aspiration is to recognize um, that there are many forms of um, of of labor that we you know I think I think we're seeing this all the time now where you see actually like on the left like a tendency to name new forms of labor whether it's even the sort of you know like wages for Facebook kind of kind of tongue in cheek but also um, trying to name something that we are all sort of in our daily lives producing value for capital um, and that like many of the activities that we just sort of like do are are like creating value somewhere and I think um, trying to recognize that. Um, in some way that isn't just saying like, okay, now like here's a dollar for every Facebook post you put up because that's building an online community or just creating money for Facebook or whatever. You know, I think this is sort of the impetus um, behind uh, behind what I think of at least of a sort of um, idea of basic income and its merits. With, with regards to the ownership of the means of production, I, I, the Alaska model that you brought up is actually quite interesting because it's not um, it's not simply that Alaska gets oil royalties and then out of, you know, just collects that pool of money and then pays it out every year. It's that with that pool of money, um, it buys stocks and bonds. It, it, it collectivizes ownership, small claims on ownership of the means of production, and then out of that fund, out of the dividends and interest that that fund earns, then pays out. That's um, not an advantage of the program. It's the, the fact that it buys stocks and bonds only perpetuates a highly financialized society and an ever-increasing money manager capitalism. You don't want to tie your well-being to, to the financial sector. You have to divorce it. Oh. Well, those of you clapping, think, think, about, think about what you mean by collectivizing ownership of the means of production, because ownership of the means of production is represented in capital stock, in stocks, no, and if it's a sovereign wealth fund owning those stocks, that is the public. It, maybe it was long ago when the stock market served the purpose of raising funds for capital. Now, the stock market exists for its own sake. It does not, it, it, yeah, it, it doesn't raise any funds. It doesn't finance productive activity. Shout out to Doug Henwood's book, Wall Street, which is the best <laughs> investigation of that. I, I can jump in and see from the audience response, I can say something that might be somewhat popular for the federal job guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> the automatic stabilizing provision of it would, it would uh, basically reduce the need of the federal government to have to bail out the financial sector the next time the Wall Street cowboys want to go roughshod. And right, if we, have an, if we have a federal job guarantee, that would reduce the need to have to bail out the financial sector because of the fear that the middle, the person on Main Street might suffer if we have a collapsed financial sector. Yeah. 
wasn't as popular as I thought it was. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, hi, so I, I have a question about uh, the, the point you just made a few minutes ago about how a, a basic income would have to be progressive, I think was the word used. The, the meaning being that you would give more money to people who are poorer and less money or no money to people who are richer instead of giving a flat rate to everybody. And I have a few questions about that. So one is, wouldn't doing it that way necessitate a, a set of kind of inefficient means testing wherein not, not only would it make the whole process more complicated and probably less efficient, but it, but it would also make it so that people who were in higher income brackets had some notion that you know, they earned their money and they're richer, whereas poor people are, uh, are dependent and ask themselves, like, why should they give things for free? Whereas if everyone is getting the exact same size to check, then A, it's perfectly egalitarian and no one can say that, but B, the less money you have to begin with, the, the more relative value you get from that check. And then finally, why can't we just tax the rich a lot more to pay for all of this and, and then make it a form of redistribution? What's, what's done about all the things no, okay, let me go with the tax question. Please, like, money doesn't grow on rich people. They have a lot of it, but it doesn't, it doesn't come from them. When the government sector wants to pay for a program, they pass a budget. They appropriate it, and the Fed pays. They never bounce a government check. When you pay your taxes at the federal level, I don't want to get to technical reserves, get debited, they get disappear from the system. There isn't a big giant vault that collects your tax dollars that, that's locked up there, and then the government goes and digs up money to spend. So it's, it's all about policy priorities. The federal government spends in its own resource. If you want to sell it that way, let's tax the rich people to pay for the poor, we will lose every time, because the rich people have power, they have resources, and they will convince X, Y, and Z that there's not enough money. Right? And we have just run out of money for this very generous program. So you have to sell it on the right paradigm. We value it. We insist on this permanent program. The government has to commit to it, period. And um, the other issue is that I agree on the aspect that programs have to be universal. I mean, Derek can talk about the progressive aspects. Um, I, the way I see the progressive aspect of the, base, of the basic income is if it is tied to participation and public goods provisioning directly. That whatever you are, you're providing income for, you're at the same time providing the things that people need and you're bringing them into the fold in the process of their own provisioning. Like that's the inherent connection that I see. So I wouldn't actually favor like, you know, um, uh, a, a more generous income support for the poor, less generous, for, because it, it's just going to be another welfare program. That's how it's going to be sold. It's not going to survive. So we disagree. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I certainly... You know, you guys are supposed to be on a team against... <laughs> <laughs> um, we need tax reform in this country. I agree that to market... Mark, well, I don't disagree with you on the point of we can pay for it. We have the means to pay for it. I, I agree with that. But in addition to that, we do need tax reform because we subsidize the wealthy with our tax code by, by way of different tax rates on capital gains versus income, um, being mortgage interest deduction. Most people don't, don't file, itemize their tax, tax forms, so they miss out on a lot of the benefits of the mortgage interest deduction, for example. We spend about $500 billion subsidizing assets through things like mortgage interest deduction, differences in capital gains. The problem is how that money is distributed, not the dollar value. The top 5% receive, um, I think about, what was it? The top 5%, um, I think this is accurate, I'm pretty sure, about 60% of the benefit. The bottom 60% of, of, of tax filers receive about 5% of the benefit. So that, that pot of money needs to be redistributed in a, a, a more fair way where Americans are getting access to it. But that's separate from how we, if, if and how we can finance things like a basic income or federal job guarantee. Um, but I do hold firm that if you don't have the progressive element to something like a basic income, you are actually going to exacerbate inequality for all the reasons I named. I'm happy to name them again, but it would be problematic. When you say progressive, it, it, is that different from means testing or does it just sound better? You know, it sounds better, but there's, <laughs> there's going to be some criteria by based on the, the position in which you're, you are in. Why right? the, so Why can't the benefit be flat and uniform for everyone, but the tax code can be heavily progressive? Like, that's, that's what I'm suggesting. But everyone, 
getting the same amount of money from the government, but the more money you earn, the more the higher tax. So it, so it nets out to yeah. means test. So it's regret, well, but in a, in a kind of a, it seems fair. Everyone is getting the same size check. Isn't, isn't that kind of what a negative income tax is? That, that is. I mean, but it's now conditional. It's semantic. We're talking, right, what's the difference between a transfer and a tax payment? In my Econ 101 class, it's a negative sign versus a positive sign, right? Taxes and transfers are just the flip side of, of each other. So if, I guess in theory, we can come up with a mechanism where the tax code is so progressive that we can just give everybody a flat basic income. In that sense, I'm not opposed to it. But. No, okay, I, so I have to interject again. Tax the rich, right? Tax them not because you want to balance some other account. Tax them because their income causes misallocation of resources, because their income causes inequality, financial instability, misery. That's the reason why you tax them, for the real resources, not because we don't have money. So they have to be separate. We don't need to do this some weird accounting where money goes from here, goes from here. You're going to have a deficit and you're going to have a surplus depending on how the economy is doing. They're two separate forces. They're independent from each other. And it's just an accounting result. Um, let's see. We've got two minutes until nine, so let's take one last question, and then we'll, uh, yeah, right there in the corner. Hi. Um, I want to take this on a more international scale now, because obviously the U.S. is a function as like a closing market. Oh, you can use the mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I guess like one, like one, one question would be like, what do you think the effects international would be of like? basic income, um, like would it exacerbate like imperialism? Like, um, and maybe a second question, which, I, which for me is more important, is like what is the role of like international anti-imperialist struggles um, in terms of like, I don't know, getting their own national liberation from the US? Because my understanding is that we're talking about um, just um, this income within the United States. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I've thought a little bit about the international uh, implication. So you're going to get a basic income here in the U.S., and a lot of the bad jobs are going to disappear, but they're going to go to China. So the stuff that we buy with our basic income is going to be produced by some slave labor somewhere else, right? So like, you, it's, it's, it's going to have some of these kind of implications because our consumption is going to go up, and we've outsourced the jobs, but they won't really come, come back here. How do you empower uh, countries? I actually see the job guarantee as empowering. You don't depend on shipping your resources to the United States to get their dollars to develop your own country. You just mobilize your domestic resources. Now, some countries are going to be resource poor. They'll have to buy capital. There will be some constraints in terms of resources. But you can always, in the domestic currency, buy labor within the country and provision given your resources, you know, still internally developed with your own internal currency. So you can create employment that is not dependent on international considerations. Can I ask a little follow-up? Because you're, you're from Bulgaria, is that right? Originally, Originally from Bulgaria. Yeah. So I, I want to ask about it in the European context where um, currencies are, are not sovereign. Yep. They can't. They cannot do. I mean, they are. Uh, there, there, there basically could be no job guarantee in. Say, they could be, Italy. but they cannot possibly fund. The way the, the euro works is, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a perpetual deflationary environment. It's going to be much more unemployment, much more misery, and they will not have. They don't have the funding mechanism to do euro-wide pro-growth policy. They don't have federal government. They don't have fiscal policy. Um, the central bank uh, does not fund individual governments. So it is. Uh, it's a losing game. They have to re reform it one way or another. They actually have a job guarantee. They have a youth job guarantee on the books. Um, and then they tell the countries, uh, we'll provide some seed money, but you have to fund it. Nobody's doing it, of mm. course, because they are you know, chasing austerity policies. What about, Derek, the, the international implications? You know, uh, well, I agree. That I'll, I'll answer that question with I agree. Um, but I'll say that Tom <laughs> Tomas Pekedi talked about um, an international tax on capital, and I dare say the word redistribution. So we, we want a, a society that is inclusive regardless of national borders. We do need to think about capital flows and taxing that capital in some form of redistribution. You, you asked me the political question, I don't know the answer to it, <laughs> but, but that, that's the mechanism. Melissa? 
Um, I guess just first, I think, you know, I think both of these in terms of the sort of like, will our bad jobs go somewhere else? Like, well, that seems true of the job guarantee. Also, like, if part of the point is to improve quality of work and give people options to opt out of bad work. In either case, like, I think, you know, the, the problem of like bad jobs going elsewhere is, is, is one and that's, but that's one of all labor standards in a global economy. And like, I don't know that we can sort of solve that in one, um, in one fell swoop. Um, I'm curious, I don't totally, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by whether basic income would exacerbate um, like imperial projects. Yeah, I don't, I just, I'm just not sure like how to respond because I'm not sure quite like what, how that would. Yeah, I mean like my understanding of like the basic income is that it doesn't really necessarily mean that like say U.S. imperialism will like decrease <coughs> or will be like completely get not rid of and so. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. I don't think basic income will probably like banish imperialism. Um, I think probably a job guarantee won't either. I think probably a lot of sort of like one-shot policies will not um, end U.S. imperialism. But again, as, as I was saying before, I do think there's a lot of interesting, like a lot of the most interesting experimental politics around, I think, basic income are happening internationally um, in countries that have um, have lost out in the sort of like global race for jobs, like in places where they're, you know, they don't even have the sort of um, like really terrible jobs um, of, uh, you know, working in a sweatshop in China. Like you don't have access even to those and, um, so I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of places where the, the option, where more people actually are on um, some sort of social grant or social benefit. It's not a basic income, but are receiving income through a social grant rather than through um, wage work. And so thinking, like, I think that is actually where we can, um, or should be looking, like, I don't think there's an answer yet there, but I think that is, like, what, um, that is, like, where this politics, I think, is really happening um, internationally, and sort of, like, new politics around distribution and, and what to do with, um, uh, I think, or, or both redistribution and just generally distributive politics um, are, are playing out. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's still, like, a, I think this is very nascent, um, but I don't, yeah, so it's not, a, it's not a cure for imperialism, but it might be a, an interesting new, like, um, I think that rather than sort of saying, uh, I guess in the sense that um, rather than holding up like sort of US and European like uh, post-war social democracy as sort of like the, the end state that all countries will eventually achieve, um, there are, um, you know, I think uh, the, the sort of beginning politics around basic income internationally are sort of often happening in places where that just seems completely infeasible. And so I guess that's, um, it's a it's a different model. The, the Namibian example is particularly interesting and, and well worth looking into. I'll just mention one other thing on this question about a basic income and a job guarantee, which is that so much of the reason it seems to me that we continually make war is that um, the employment prospects for large swaths of our country rely on the military industrial complex and the continual financing of new war production. Um, also prison industrial complex, the fossil fuel extraction industrial complex, all of these sectors in the American economy that provide millions and millions of jobs uh, sort of necessitate the continual upkeep of the systems that do the employment. And so providing people with meaningful work that is not in those sectors um, takes the political pressure off of those. And, and it ma makes it so that you can shut down a prison, say, without devastating the community for whom the prison serves as an as a economic anchor. Um, and same with like war production stuff in the, in the states, in the, you know, in the Great Plains and stuff where there isn't, you know, the, big metropolises aren't really there and a lot of the economy is based on, you know, building bombs and planes and stuff like that. Um, providing a job guarantee or basic income uh, relieves the pressure and, and, and sort of gives us a way into shutting down some of those operations. So that's just a, one idea. I mean, I mean, the other thing that I uh, keep surprised it didn't, well, military might be the closest thing we have to a federal job guarantee in the country, kind of ironically. Uh, but the other point that I'm surprised didn't come up and it's related to your question, is what about undocumented workers? Would they qualify for a basic income or would they qualify for a federal job guarantee? Um, so I guess I posed it, so the answer would be, I think we need comprehensive immigration reform, but I'm gonna make the claim that perhaps they wouldn't. 
Mm, provocative. Um, I'm going to just check with Colin real quick. I, I, I'm, my impulse is to take this last question, but we are at um, 9.07, so I pass the buck. <laughs> uh, okay, if there's one more burning question, we can take it. Um, we can, people are also welcome for, uh, to stick around for a few more minutes, maybe one more quick glass of wine uh, to talk a little bit more, and then we'll have to head out out of respect to our hosts. All right, so by show of twinkles up or down, take this last question or cool it out? Nobody cares. Let's hear the question. <laughs> I just, on the imperialism question and the job guarantee, when Coretta Scott King in the 1970s led the Full Employment Action Council, which was the largest group fighting for guaranteed jobs in the 1970s, she did it explicitly under, the, under an understanding that, we've ne as she put it, we've never adequately dealt with the question of a peacetime economy that, you know, as Jesse was alluding to, the sort of Keynesianism that existed in the US was always a military Keynesianism. And so in order to get out of that, you needed a job guarantee. And embedded within that struggle for a job guarantee was a call for a basic income, which you know, grew from black freedom movements you know, 40 years before. Splendid, what a great way to go out. Thank you for that. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you for putting this on. Thanks to Verso and Jacobin and Descent and the New Economy Coalition. Let's get drunk. <laughs>